Well, this is the Kids Have Sons editorial board. We're sitting here with the candidates for Port Orchard Mayor, um, the incumbent mayor, Tim Mathis, and the challenger, Rob Putansu. Um, what I'd let you guys do is just take two minutes to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you've been doing, and why, why you want to run for this office, and then we'll do some questions and answers. Um, Jim kind of watches the clock for us, and so two minutes. he may, yeah, give him two minutes, and he'll kind of wave to say, hi, you up. Tim, we'll let you go first. Oh, great. Well, my, my name is Tim Mathis, and I'm uh, presently employed as the mayor of Port Orchard. And, you know, I'd like to tell you just a little about the, my personal mission is to continue working for the citizens of Port Orchard and make their interests my highest priority. I believe that the city should strive to be as business friendly as we possibly can be, but not be, appear to be for sale to the highest bidder or, the, or a single organization. Uh, growth is coming to our city. In fact, growth is already here. In just the last few years, because of annexations, we've practically doubled in size. And I still believe, though, that even when growth is coming at, at a fairly rapid pace, that the citizens and the city can work together to manage that growth. And my goal is to manage the growth so we still love living in Port Orchard after it's passed us, after we've reached our, our maximum growth. So. When I first started for, or ran for office in 2011, I said I love Port Orchard. I don't want to see it drastically changed. I have not changed at all. And you know, a lot of folks have came up to me in the last three and a half years and said, I'm with you. Uh, we, and growth is inevitable, but we need to manage it carefully. So I feel that I'm, I'm in touch with the pulse of the community on that. Um, I made three promises this year in my run for re-election. And the first one is I will continue to lead continue to clearly state what I believe in and what I will do. I will tell the folks out there in Port Orchard the truth and work to make decisions that they will be proud of and will get behind. I will continue to hold town hall meetings and try to find other methods to discover what's important to the citizens. And actually, uh, I did that uh, just a, a little while ago. The, my staff and I picked a website company Oops. Okay. Go ahead. No, no, finish your thought. Finish your well, thought. We, we, we picked a website company to so, so we could start doing surveys. Okay. And it turned out we didn't get what we thought as far as records management, which is very important to our city, so we had to cancel that. But we're not giving up. We're going to continue to look for ways to engage the public. Okay. Rob, thank you. <clears throat> my name is Rob Putansu, and uh, I'm uh, running for mayor because I want to make uh, my community a, <clears throat> community a better place. Um, I grew up in the community. Uh, I went to school in, in uh, South Kitsap, uh, graduated from South Kitsap, raised my family in the community, and have worked more than half of my career at a community bank in the community. And I feel I have the skill set to move our community forward. Uh, I'm past president of my Rotary Club, past president of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm in my third term on the city council. I believe I bring a skill set uh, to the job that uh, would, can help work, enable me to work collaboratively with others and provide leadership to move us forward. I'm very dissatisfied with um, the direction of our city or the, or the lack of um, economic opportunities. I look at Bremerton, I look at Silverdale, I look at Cape Harbor, and there's so much going on around us. and I don't see that in, in particular our downtown, whether it's infrastructure, zoning, density, I'm not sure what it is, but I think we need to sit down with the property owners, the business owners, and the community and figure out what's lacking because something's definitely lacking because if we have those components in place, I think the market will take care of itself. So I'm running for this office because I want to see our community be a better place. Uh, been a banker for 29 years. I've been very successful at it. That's what I'm currently doing right now. And uh, I'm going to step away from that career because I feel that uh, you shouldn't complain about things. Um, you should step forward and make change. And I think I can make my community a better place. Follow up on that. Um, let's start with that first question about that you bring up with economics and especially downtown, some of the revitalization that some has gone on over the years, but like you're saying, you probably could take another step forward. Um, there's some vacant buildings down there. Um, you've been on the council. What do you feel the council has maybe 
talked about that you'd like to pursue further or other policies? Because that's kind of how the, you know, that's the, the, the way this would work is that what policy maybe do you see Bremerton, Silverdale, and other city doing to say, we could do that kind of a thing and it would really help? What do you see there? Well, as a council member, you're one of seven on a policy board. I think we've made some, some nice steps uh, with the pedestrian pathway in particular. Um, I was one of the bigger proponents of that. My opponent was uh, very much against that project. Um, I was the one that fostered the idea of the compromise to uh, buy the homes that wanted to sell. There was five homes. There's one homeowner that doesn't want to sell. And so let's design around the one homeowner. Um, I'm not sure what's missing, but there's definitely something missing, whether it's zoning, density, and we need to work collaboratively with everybody. That, I mean, we've got property owners with vacant buildings. Uh, we have, um, you know, the business community. We have the residents of the area. We need to all sit down and figure out what we want for our community and, and what we want it to look like. And, and I, I, I strongly believe if in the, mar in the marketplace, it will, the market will take, it, it isn't government's role to be a developer. Uh, it's providing the right infrastructure, uh, potentially public amenities like our pedestrian pathway. Um, so I think those are some of the challenges to our downtown. And, and the, what about, let me ask a follow-up question. Um, Bremerton has, a, has done this, I think it's two years old now. Um, where the city has taken more of a focus on vacant buildings. Mm -hmm. um, of course, and that's a little different than vacancies. What they've cracked down on is kind of nuisance properties. But, I mean, you could argue that Myrie's has been I, kind, I, of a, <laughs> kind of a, in sad shape for a long time. Do you think that's appropriate for the city to maybe target and say, we're going we're gonna to push against you when we see things like this? I completely agree, and I think we should not try to reinvent the wheel and, and look at what other, other communities are doing. Um, I think we need to sit down with those property owners and what are your plans because what I'm seeing there isn't acceptable to me. Tim, what do you think? Um, have you sat down with those property owners? Do you think I've that's tried. the mayor's I've tried. Uh, the Sam Lepore is the owner of mm -hmm. about 60% of the assessed value of downtown. Uh, Sam Lepore is his last name. He's He's lives a, in he, Bellevue, he lives in Bellevue. Or I believe he lives over in that area. Yeah. Uh, I, I reached out to him a couple of times. Uh, he hasn't returned any of my, uh, my letters or anything you know, to, to want to sit down. But I'm not giving up on that. Uh, I joked that I uh, told my wife, uh, he, he spends a lot of time in Dubai. He's a very wealthy man. And I told my wife the other day, I said, well, he's not answering my letters. I think I'm going to go over to Dubai and wait in his office over there. That'll surprise him. Because I want to go and see Dubai anyway, because of the architecture. But anyway, uh, that's a joke, really. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I really wish I knew where he was coming from. Because uh, when you own 60% of something, you have a pretty, pretty big control of what's going on there. Um, right now, uh, Myrie's is a bone of contention. But I want to say, Myrie's was in litigation for three years. The first three years I was in office. There was three attorneys fighting over who got possession of that. There was an attorney for the person who sold it on contract. There was a person that bought it on contract. And there was an attorney for the uh, people that did the contract work on it. And all of them said they had a big interest in it. So it, it took that three years to work that through the courts to finally say, OK, one person owned it. They can auction it off. And Mr. Samapur bought it. About so, nine months ago. Is there a tool then the city could use more effectively, or maybe a tool you see being used elsewhere to kind of zoning policy, something like that that could spur some of that? And, and uh, let me give Mary's, my really quickly. Let me give you an example yeah. of it. Uh, um, we purchased a property uh, just down the street, uh -huh. and it was burned out also. Sure. And it was uh, the Cabo's yep. Mexican restaurant, yeah, and it was burned out, smelled bad. It was right next to City Hall, right down the street. We were going to take all of those procedures and apply them to Los Cabos. We found out that we'd have to have an additional $300,000. In other words, we had to remove that building. If nobody was going to listen to us and own up to being the owner, we had to go in and remove it. And it was going to cost over $300,000 for the city to do that. We didn't have that on our, in our budget. 
So I'm just saying it's not very practical to say, well, we'll just go in there and make them. If they won't do something, then we have to do it, and then all we can do is lean the property. But it could take 5, 10, or 15 years okay. for us to get anything out of it. Well, maybe, maybe move away from, um, and I, I don't want to get bogged down because there's only a handful of those kind of problem properties. Right. That's, gen that's not the general part of the city. What about the other side of the question? Um, what do you think is has worked during the last couple of years as far as economic development? And, you know, what uh, what tools would you like to pursue? What well, would you like to see the city council it, work on? It actually, it was working fine until about four months ago, and I, I'm not sure what's going on, but we, we're getting a, a rash of vacancies again. We actually had clawed our way back to about 75, 80% full. Um, part of the problem is the economy is still not back up to you know, vibrant and robust. And these small businesses that start out down there, a lot of them underestimate what it's going to take to, to get viable and to you know, start making a profit. And so just when we get a couple of steps forward, then we have to take a step back. Somebody closes. So um, my belief is still that we need to get more folks from Seattle over here. We need to get, uh, Pike Place is too crowded. If you, if you take any of your family or friends to Pike Place, Mine all tell me they get claustrophobic, there's so many people. Well, they can walk to Port Orchard. We just need to press you know, forward and get people to realize they can take a ferry, beautiful ride, take another ferry there in Port Orchard. So that's my big plan is to uh, encourage small businesses up and down Bay Street, fill the buildings, and then have a, you know, a viable tourist. Okay, I'm gonna, ask you, about the, the I'm gonna ask you about the pedestrian path in just a minute, but you wanted to respond to something? Uh, yeah. I, I guess I'm disappointed in my opponent's effort because to reach out to Monsoor because I've met with him twice in the last year. And um, while we don't necessarily agree on all of his ideas, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be meeting with these property owners. We need to be meeting with the businesses and the community and figure out what makes sense for these properties because it's not acceptable the way that it is. And I also completely disagree that the economy is the driver in Port Orchard. Look at all the things going on around us. Um, we, we're, we're missing something. What do you see, you know, Tim's kind of saying tourism. This is what I was hearing from you. What, when, you when you say, what's your vision for that? What does we, it kind we of look like? We've got an industrial park. We need jobs. We, we need uh, economic growth. Uh, we've got an industrial park that only has, has two manufacturing businesses and a whole bunch of property. We need to be sitting down with our regional partners, uh, you know, KEDA, KEDA, uh, HD is acronyms, Gets Epic Economic Development Alliance, the Aerospace Alliance, uh, and working collaboratively uh, to attract business to our community and jobs. How do you feel their relationship is with those organizations right now? KEDA, PSRC, anyone like that? I believe we're attending, but we're not working collaboratively to make things happen. I think we need to be more actively involved in that, those processes. Same way with uh, PSRC, KS, KRCC, our, our um, you know, policy and transportation boards. We need to be active, very active with these organizations. That's where the money comes from to, for our transportation solutions. And I don't believe we're working hard enough. And as mayor, I will work hard to, to make, you know, make those things happen. Um. You're kind of connecting to it. The city has done a good job at um, laying money from the legislature for some of the infrastructure that's gone on. Um, how do you know? I, maybe we'll let maybe we'll let Tim ask this one. But what do you think? What do you think? Why does that happen? Why has Port Orchard been successful in getting some of its projects funded? And what's the next step of that? How you, you're doing well over here? How can that not translate into doing more of it, bringing bringing something else? In? Um, well, I disagree. Everybody else is doing better than Port Orchard. I think Port Orchard's holding its own. In fact, in some cases, it's doing better. We received four grants from the county or from the state, uh, amounting to almost four point five million dollars this year. And you ask, why would I want to run again? I'm just so enthused. We're going to be able to see a large portion of pedestrian Bay Street path accomplished. And I might go back to the the comment that my. Uh, my opponent made that was, that's almost laughable when he says I've not been in favor of the path. Actually, we've done four sections of the path while I've been a mayor. 
We've done the DeKalb Street section of the Bay Street pedestrian path. We've done the marina part of the path. We've done the West Bay part of the path. And right now, I just signed a contract to build the bridge across Blackjack. Those are all four sections. We're talking about the homes. Is that, I mean, yeah. we can just clear Well, up. okay. If, if, yeah, I, I, I was against taking anybody's path. home, and I still am. I don't believe we should take a home for a path or a trail. And what's going to happen, just again, I think we've been reading, but just to make, make it clear, there are, there are five properties. Five homes, yeah. And one of them intends to stay in that home, and now the path must be At least one of them. Home. At least one of them. I'm not sure. I, I would say that's fairly correct. Yes. Um, that was a compromise because it was initially either we cannot do this at all or we need every home. And it was my idea. It was the compromise. You, you were in favor of the compromise. You would no, all. I, I, I actually came up with the idea. Okay. Actually, <laughs> actually, it was right after I testified that there's no way to take. We should take the property. That they. Are you are you are you satisfied with how this is set? As long as they stick to what they said. Okay. I mean, but if they come back later, and I'm afraid they might, and say, "Oh, gee, uh, it's still a federalized project." Now, now the big brothers told us we have to take that property. The man that doesn't want to sell has told me he's worried about that, and I. Told him I was too. That you'll not get the money to actually build the thing because you don't have the I don't know if that's the case or, or if that could happen. Are you, I don't are know you right. worried about that? I'm not concerned with that at all. Good. I think good. we've got a good project, and uh, like I said, I was the one that brought the compromise that's forward. That's good. Okay. Then let we me, agree. Let me, let me go back to where I was maybe tried to go with that other question. Um, we we're talking about KEDA and some of these other regional organizations. During your time as mayor, how involved have you been with those? How do you feel about those relationships? Oh, fine. I, I'm on the KEDA board. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, and I've been, you know, you know, attending every meeting. I don't think I've missed any. Of them. How have you seen that benefit Port Orchard? What do you think of the typical um, result? Is? Well, right now, the, the real benefit of, of Kitsap Economic Development has been um, in, in areas that there's an opportunity presented to them. Um, they they go looking for people, but if somebody comes and says, "I want this information about Kitsap." They don't care what part of Kits at, but they try to fit them wherever they need to be. So um, I guess we just haven't had enough property or enough opportunity in just the right area for some of the, the folks that came to Kita. But what, what do you, we will. As you're sitting at that table, because you're the one with the seat as a representative, then what are you saying in those meetings? Here's what Port Orchard's got to offer. Here's what we'd like to exactly. see. Here's what you can bring in. Exactly. And I'm also firmly behind, it used to be the Skia industrial area. And now it's changed the name, but it's still the ski industrial area. I'm really behind that whole program because if we can improve skia, we're going to have better job, you know, production in the future. It's not in Port Orchard, but it's close enough to where we need to participate and help uh, Bremerton Port and skia. Mm -hmm. um, so, you asked a question about the, the success we had with the legislature, and mm -hmm. and I can speak to that as. I would almost say that we've had success in spite of our mayor. Um, those were projects that were started long before uh, the current administration. The uh, plans we've made, the designs we've done. Our lobbyist is one who did, did the, the heavy The city still retains the lobbyist. Yeah, which we've had her for a number of years. It's been back to Yeah, and, and, and I would say. She's been on board about six before, years. Yeah, five yes, years. yes, she has. And, and it's Jan Angel, it's Michelle Caldier, and Jesse Young, who all, you know, should be thanked for the, the funds that they brought, you know, to the city of Port Orchard. And, and I've personally thanked them, and I'm not sure that my opponent has. Let me ask this question, because you're talking about the city lobbyist and kind of the role that person plays. And truly, I think so, and that's a success. I think you should be proud of that. Um, there was an issue before the city council, in, and I think this is something that you brought up, and that's why I wanted to ask you about it, Rob with the city manager role and mm -hmm. whether that's appropriate for the city the size of Port Orchard. Mm -hmm. If you're elected mayor, do you still feel that way? Well, um, because this is a sig that would be yeah. a significant change in what you're running. What, what that was about for me was about professional management, okay? And we brought, I felt that we did the right thing. We brought a ballot measure to our citizens. Our citizens voted on the issue and said, no, we don't want a professional manager like Bainbridge Island has or some other cities have that we want a strong mayor to form a government. And I'm OK with that. Okay. And I support that. And I believe I represent professional management. So, and that's part of why I'm running, okay. is so that uh, I want to make a difference in my community. And I believe I have the skill sets, skill set uh, uh, 
to move our city forward. Nice. Um, Tim, you were talking earlier about growth and how growth is inevitable and you have a couple areas that are starting to build homes and things like that. One of the things that the city council started talking about and having some public meetings is um, impact fees, possibly a transportation benefit district, start to pay for some of the roads and sidewalks and other things that you're going to need or you want to fix up. Where do you stand as far as those conversations go? What would you like to see pursued and what do you think is the most likely thing um, to, to, to pay for this stuff? Well, we need a combination. Uh, no one, there's no magic bullet or silver bullet here that could fund it all. Uh, we need to first of all get very real as far as projects that we need to go forward on. We have some legacy, legacy projects that truthfully were on in the queue before I became mayor. Um, we're having to still deal with those. One of them is a tree mark. Uh, bad project in my opinion. If, if I have had anything to do with that to start with, I would not have followed up on it. Uh, however, it's a legacy project that we're kind of stuck with now, so we have to do something with it. Uh, there's also a um, Bethel Corridor plan. That was another legacy project that we, we received from the county. It's a wonderful, big, beautiful plan. It just wasn't very practical. It wasn't very practical for a city or for a county of 250,000 to build, and it's sure not practical for a city of 13,000 to accomplish. I mean, it's, for crying out loud, it was or $45 million about eight years ago was the estimated value of that project. So uh, I guess legacy projects, you know, are what we have to deal with now uh, just because we're committed to some of them. But you're making a comprehensive plan at the same time. You're starting to look at some of this stuff. And that has to road. dovetail in with Are you, that. Yeah. Do, you, do you think impact fees is a good way to do that? Uh, you that know, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing that we need a reasonable impact fee uh -huh. along yeah. with other methods of funding. I wish I had a couple of more years to build confidence with the taxpayer because, you know, if the taxpayer believes they're going to get their money's worth, they're more likely to go along with additional taxes, which we're going to need. Um, I, I do applaud this council. They have not taken the high road or the, the chicken's way out and said we're not doing anything until after election. They're still working towards impact fees. I believe a fair and equitable impact fee is mandatory. It's just one, but it's just one part of what we have to do. But then we have to be very careful that the citizens see something from that and appreciate that we're doing the best job with that money. So, I think your city's had a good reputation over the years for that. So. I, I hope so. I hope so, and I hope we can build on that reputation. Yeah. Rob, you're the one you're sitting on this council right now debating this. Um, how do you feel about impact fees, transportation benefit districts? Um, I think they're both needed. They're, they're tools that we need to have in our toolbox. Um, on the impact fee side, we're still studying the the project list, and it's pretty grandiose. We just, you know. Would I love a complete street on Bethel uh, from end to end, bike paths, sidewalks, turn lanes, the whole length of it? Absolutely. Um, but the price tag is staggering. I think we need to uh, value engineer what the county had, which was $50 million, uh, and figure out what our community can afford. Um, and we need to do it in, in a segmented approach so that uh, we can bite off bits and pieces of it. To answer your question about the impact fee, yes, but it needs to be reasonable. And it's something that we can analyze on a year-by-year -year basis, uh, the project list and the size of the fee. I think it needs to be as small as we can have it to begin with because, as we're seeing, there's not a lot of growth happening in Port Orchard or economic activity. And if you add another fee on top of that, are we going to push, you know, cause things not to happen. And so we need it, absolutely. Growth needs to help pay for growth, uh, you know, in order to widen those streets um, and, and to pay for those street improvements. Yeah. So, yes. One of, the, one of the places, when I drove, drive through Port Orchard that I really noticed, the one thing you guys have is there is land, especially on some of the outskirts out towards McCormick Woods, out towards Trophy Lake mm -hmm. out there, over on mm -hmm. Phillips Road. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of shovels and things going on there. Um, the utility district is kind of trying to work with you on pushing some of the UGA, uh, some of your annexation areas. Are you comfortable going that direction? Do you think the city does, is it time to start moving the boundaries out, looking to annex some of those areas and put in sewers, put in the infrastructure, do that kind of stuff to add to the population base? 
Um, other than what I've read in the paper, the DC Utility District hasn't had any conversation oh, okay. with us, and we should be having a conversation with the Utility District about that. We grew the city leaps and bounds here in the last six years or so. Um, I think we need to grow into what we have, but we also have a legal obligation with the, with the Growth Management Act. If people want to come to Port Orchard, we need to look at those case by case. Should the city of Port Orchard be actively pursuing other annexations? I'm not in favor of that. But if someone has land that abuts the city of Port Orchard and they want to join the city of Port Orchard, we need to look at those at a case on a case by case basis. If you're elected, and again, this is a little hypothetical bit of a question, but four years from now, is Port Orchard 5,000 residents bigger, or is that too many? Um, What's, what, what size should this city be? What's, what, what kind of feels right? Where I would like to see our, our uh, I'd like to see mixed use development in our downtown, ground floor retail, some office, and I don't know, condominiums or um, apartments on top of that. I think growing about, that way. Grow, growing, grow, growing vertically in, in the footprint that we have. Um, not saying I want high rises or anything of that nature. I mean, we're allowed three stories on the water side currently and five stories on the south side, you know, the uphill side. Right. I think that's probably about, about right. But we need, once again, to be meeting with those property owners, the businesses in the community. Somebody's not going to come in and invest a few million dollars if they can't make a dollar. You know, they are, it's, it is cherry. Uh, so if it doesn't pencil, we need to figure out why it doesn't pencil. So that's where I would like to see our, our growth happen. I'm a proponent of what Kitsap Transit's doing with the passenger own high-speed ferry. I, I think for um, our downtown, or Bremerton's downtown, could uh, become a bedroom community to Seattle uh, with a 30-minute connection to, to Seattle. I think that's a tremendous opportunity. We're still in the developmental stage of, the, of that uh, process and that ballot measure. But it definitely needs to be a ballot measure, and it's got to be something that uh, that the community wants, or the county as a whole wants. Well, I'd, I'd like to make a prediction. In, in five years, we'll probably grow about 2,500 homes, and that'll uh, that'll be about uh, probably close to 4,000 folks. I think nowadays the average house is 1.8 person or something. You know, I forget what the, what the last statistics. So. Uh, somewhere around 4,000 residents in four years. We have plenty of growth area. The, our urban growth area is plenty big enough without adding what our utility partner wants to add. Okay, I'll make a prediction. That's going nowhere. Um, uh, my opponent is the chair of the, the uh, utilities committee, so if he doesn't know what our partnership over there at West Sound is up, up, up to, I don't think anybody does. Uh, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago was the first thing I heard about that proposal. Uh, I understand their position. They would love to be able to have more hookups because we're right now only at about 42 percent. Uh, and that's a partnership project that we have with the sewer plant. Half of it is the city of Port Orchard, the other half of it is West Sound Utility. Okay, I understand the, the idea that it's government and cities and utilities should strive to get the most people hooked up so it reduces the unit cost for everyone. However, I think our urban growth area is big enough, we're going to eventually fill that, those services. It may take 15 years, but I like it. It's like money in the bank, as far as I'm concerned, to have that ability to develop. So I'm in favor of not adding any more to our UGA. We already have a big enough UGA to last out to 2025 or 2030. Uh, don't see any need to do that. I know I might be running a muck there with, <laughs> with no, our utility fine. partners, but I, you know, they're going to have to convince me somehow yeah. that it's a good deal for us. No, that's interesting. It sounds like you're both kind of in a similar place on that one. When you, you know, your estimate of 4,000 folks or so in five years, how does that pair with what you started this meeting with saying managed growth? That I mean, probably, that, do you that, think that is manageable? Is that uh, it is manageable because most of it is going to be out in the McCormick area. And uh, uh, there'll be some infill, but it won't be hundreds of homes because we don't have hundreds of lots, infill lots. So most of it is going to be out in McCormick, and that's already been planned for by the county, and then we got it by default when we annexed. So uh, the planning's been done for the most part. That's, that's a big right. thing, you know. Um, we're still 
a, a little city and we still don't have a lot of staff. So that's important that the planning's already ahead of us. Um, uh, Nick Bond is a really good development director. I brought him on about two and a half years ago. He's a fine young man and he's finally getting on stride now. But I can't keep adding too much more to his plate. But I think we're manageable. I think we're going to be in good shape for that 4,000 at least homes over a five-year period. Yeah. And hopefully it's a kind of a balanced five-year instead of 1,500 all at once. Right. But if that happens, we'll get some part-time help for the departments that we need. And Well, and this and plays into that impact fee question. Yeah. It? You know that there's going to be a bunch of houses going right. there. Yeah. We'll plan for it. Yeah. And that, and that end of the city already has an impact fee, the yeah. McCormick area. Oh, they have a special one for it. Be, it was that part of that area. development agreement right. that was put in place with the county. That was a Gen 2 agreement. Yeah. Builds the fire station. So all that kind of my stuff. position is, is if half of our city has an impact fee, the whole city ought to have this, at like least the sense. same impact fee. And, and we probably need slightly more than that to pay for some of the yeah. legacy projects. What about, um, Rob was just talking about downtown and kind of his vision for maybe what could happen down there. What's your reaction? Oh, exactly. Uh, we need to uh, be an example downtown. And you know, Los Cabos building, uh, one of the problems we had once it burned down is nobody wanted to own up to tearing it down. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in basically in a, a, another attorney, and I don't want to bad mouth attorneys. We may have attorneys in our families, but there was an attorney or two fighting about who was going to be the owner and who's the decider on that property. So it was just sitting there, smelling bad and looking bad. And uh, so uh, I went down there to talk to different folks and brought it to the council that maybe we should try to purchase that property. Well, that's when I found out it, it's very expensive for a, a city like ours to take down old buildings like that because it's so expensive. You have to do all the testing for lead, asbestos, and you have to meet all the requirements and it takes months, if not years, to get it all done. So then it was my idea to, to go back to the receiver and say, if you tear that building down and give us a clean lot or a level lot that just rocks on it and prove that it's clean, we'll give you so many dollars. The council agreed. We've been negotiating on that for about nine months. Um, and then we ran into easement problems. Real estate always has some problem. You know, and this was an easement problem with a neighbor. I think I'm going to be signing the papers in just a few days to finally purchase that property. And then we can go out and ask for public or private partnerships to give us ideas of what they, and, and give citizens a chance to weigh in on what they might like to see there. And we can be a leader in showing what's possible downtown. I don't know what that might look like, but we what need is, to do what something. Is, what is possible? I mean, when you, say, well, he, when you say find someone to work with us on it, is that Putting a building up, putting a apartment could be, in, could, a, be, could be. What, well, give me an idea of what we're talking about. For one, the process was quite a bit different than what the mayor described because you really didn't have anything to do with the, the requiring that. It was an executive, I can't say a lot about what happened. Most of it was an executive session. You could ask any of our council members, but actually, I was the one that presented the idea. We were pursuing a code enforcement action, and it was going to cost us a couple hundred thousand dollars more for because of our prevailing wage requirements for us to pay an attorney to go through that process. So we as the council, and it was myself in particular at an executive session that asked those questions that we should, you know, let's get the property owner to clean this up and we agreed to buy it after they cleaned it up. Was the mayor at that meeting? That yes, session? he was. Okay. So you're both there, but you have a different opinion. Of exactly. Yeah. Suggested. Yeah. Okay. Hard, hard to start. And, that I, and out. I stand on my opinion of what happened. Well, what? Okay. But anyway, well, get to, okay. maybe, maybe. So to answer your question, to, to answer your question, yeah. I don't believe the city should be a developer. Uh, we should be developing that property. We should. We could potentially be a partner somehow in that. Um, but I don't. We should not be the lead developer, and I, ideally, we shouldn't be the developer at all. I, I want us to market the property okay. and the first person the first I don't want somebody else holding it in their land bank we've got too much of that going on on our waterfront yeah. already um, if anybody's gonna hold it the city should and uh, I don't want to see it held I want us to move forward with marketing the property and whoever can come forward with the first viable project I'm in favor of okay. selling it to move a project forward and economic opportunity in our city I guess the same point 
you guys are looking for a project, not using it as parking, you know, putting something like not that. Not for me. I, I, I'm open for almost any use right now. Anything's better than that burnout building. And right, now and I understand that. And now it's cleaned up. I need. I want to. My goal is to get the fences, the, the construction fences that look like construction fences. Yeah. They, I want to get those out of there. I'd like to put some boards up, and I'm, I'm talking to uh, you know to Mark Dorsey to, to make it look better and put some crushed rock out there. It's not expensive. I can do it within the budget. Yeah. Um, we could set some tables and some chairs there when we have. Uh, you know, functions downtown that can be kind of a little, you know, promenade or little meeting area. We can use it like that for the time being. But I believe that we should sell it. What we should do is partner with somebody and then work with them to create something that we can kind of say, this is what we'd like all of downtown to look like, whatever we come up with. And honestly, I don't know, maybe it, it will have an element of apartments. Maybe it will have uh, three floors of commercial with a parking on the top. Um, I don't know what the proposal is. Um, I'd like to hear from citizens, uh, and like I said, we're going to have a new uh, website portion where we can ask citizens, what would you like to see on it? You know, sometimes the best ideas come from the citizens. <laughs> so um, I'm just open, I'm just tickled that the city, the, the city will be able to work on that project in the next couple of years. So Joe, I, just, I just wanted to clarify, so Rob, you think the city should sell that property to someone who's going to develop it, and Tim, you think the city should keep it. We should partner with them. But, but the city would keep the property. Mm. No. We might put the property in the partnership as our, as your, our contribution. Okay, but, but the city we, would have more control. Over we'd have a little more control of what, what's going I'd on. I'd be open to a partnership. I don't believe we should be the developer. I don't believe that's government's role. I believe we're inefficient at doing that, and it costs more money. And our, t and our citizens shouldn't be paying for a development project. I think if we get, once again, the zoning, the infrastructure in place, the market will take care of itself. And we've got a prime piece of corner property there that I think some developer should be salivating over. Real quick, Rob mentioned his opinion on the passenger-only ferry, something's going on. You're working with, you, you work with Kitsap Transit, so you, you're in on this. Right, right. Well, what do you think? I think that fast passenger-only ferry uh -huh. is a disaster, and, and I don't think it's going to pass you think it would, the it muster. I, I, I don't think citizens are going to pass it at all. So a lot of this has just been a big waste of time and money. Uh, I think that boat should, it's, it's, it's not a hydrofoil. It never, it, of course, they don't say it's a hydrofoil now, but it's dangerous when it's on its foil. So I think the foil should be removed. I think it should be turned into a regular old ferry boat, and then yeah, I, we want to use it between Bremerton and, and Seattle. That's fine, but not not up on the hydrofoil when it's not. You know, I think it's a dangerous situation using that. You don't see it as any benefit to Port Orchard. It runs between Bremerton and Seattle. Oh, it, it, any 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 time we have more ferry service, it will be a benefit to Port Orchard. Yes, I do see that, but I just don't know if primarily South Kitsap residents want to tax themselves to the degree they'd have to to, to have that kind of service. Right, that's what I'm asking. Like, right. is it worth it? Do you feel it's worth it for your city? I'm hearing you say, no, this is not. Well, you know, I might like it for my city, but I don't think my tax, the taxpayers over there are going to like it. You know, that, that's, after all, who I'm really representing is the citizens. And if they say no, I say no. You know, I'm going to go with them, <laughs> whatever their decision is. Okay. Speaking of taxpayers, um, your city did one water rate increase in recent years, I believe. And with all of, you know, there's growth in these other things, there's likely that some utility, you have to look at your utilities and how you're paying for this stuff. How are you going to start talking to the citizens about that? Actually, the council uh, voted on three rate increases. Is it that many? Okay. Yeah. It's more than I thought. Like three every, what, 20 months, every 20 months, another okay. rate increase. Okay, maybe that's, they are, they are already it's coming. Stepped approach. Okay, that's, I was understanding it incorrectly. Um, how are you talking to the residents about this? What are you hearing back? Um, how are you responding to it? Is there There's a big misconception, here? you know. People think, and same thing with stormwater, they uh -huh. think, well, I don't have any stormwater problem. But we have to explain to them it's an educational problem. We have to say, this is for all of the city. So just because you don't have a stormwater problem, I can't, you know, say, all right, you don't have to pay stormwater. It's for all the different projects. And that's the same with any utility. We have to upgrade everybody's pipes, 
may not be in your street, but somebody else's right. street needs it. So that's the hard thing. And they, you, they don't see why they should have to pay more. Are you hearing this a lot from people? people I hearing? am. I am. But I'm there every day. Uh, I, I, get, I feel the calls after the utility uh, rate folks get irate citizens. I tell them, bring them or send them to me. And is this, this the, the tears that you're walking through? Is that enough at the end to take care of what needs to be taken care of? Or is this something the city's going to face again in the near future? We're in the midst of a, a gap analysis. We've hired a professional consultant okay. to determine what our water and sewer needs are into the future. Um, there's a misconception many times, you know, when you go through these public processes, you don't, many don't realize that your sewer and water utility isn't part of the general fund. It's an enterprise fund, and you're paying for a service. Um, so those services need to stand stand on their own. Unfortunately, in our community. I've chaired the utility committee for a couple of terms now, and we continually, and it started long before I got on the council, we want to kick the can down the road and not pay, f we're willing to raise the rate to cover the operating need, but we're not willing to invest in infrastructure, and we continually kick the can down the road, and it continues to get more and more expensive. And so it's convincing your citizens that this is a good investment, uh, you know, we're, Right now, unfortunately, building a $6 million water project uh, to hook our well, one of our wells online, um, and we had to borrow the money because we weren't willing to raise our rates sufficiently, you know, to pay for it with cash, which I would have much rather done. But, you know, the council's a body of seven, the policy board, and it takes four votes uh, to make that happen. Um, it didn't happen. All we did for over a number of years was just raise rates to copper, cover the operating loss and not invest in our infrastructure. So now we're stuck paying for it with a loan and we part of that gap analysis is we got to ha have money to repay that loan. Isn't this a good time to borrow by? It, it's it's certainly, you know, I do that for and a living. You're going to do that. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, but I would have much rather had it, the cash to do it. But you're right. It is borrowings are cheap right now and we got a very good rate. Um, would have liked to have borrowed less or, or not at all. I think it's we better. actually got a really good, yeah. and it's a it's state utility fund that, that they're not funding anymore, so probably now is as good a time as any to, to get that loan. Uh, I think it was 2.8% or something like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it'd be ideal if we had six million in the bank. I don't know if too many small cities would carry that kind of bank account from year to year. So. Uh, at least we got a good rate, and uh, and that's going to be a well that's going to provide us water for the next 20 years. Uh, not all of our water, but I mean, provide us growth and infrastructure for the next 20 years. So it's, it's a pretty important piece of our utilities. Yeah. I um, am interested in uh, public health, and the city mayors sit on the public health district board here in Kitsap. And I'd like you, each of you, to explain what you believe your role is on the board and um, what your responsibilities are uh, to the citizens of, of Port Orchard with respect to public health. Well, we have a really good county public health department. And uh, on the board, uh, they, we have a meeting monthly and sometimes two, but most of the time always once a month. Um, it's, it's a, uh, a large volume of information that our public health board gives us, uh, sometimes two, three hundred pages. So you have to be willing to read a lot and highlight and use a lot of sticky notes and ask a lot of questions. But primarily, I depend a lot on that physician and, and the nurses of the public health board to tell me things that, you know, I wouldn't ordinarily have a, a knowledge about, and that's public health. And then so, what, we, what do you do with that Well, I ask questions at the board meetings. Uh, but I mean, after the board meeting, what? Well, we vote on it. We, you know, for instance, right now, uh, e-cigarettes are a big, mm -hmm. big thing. And we've been working for the last probably four months off and on on these board meetings about what are we going to do. Well, the board just uh, uh, is leaning at least to voting on treating them exactly the same way as cigarettes and, mm -hmm. and not allowing for anyone under 18. And, you know, of course, having them so many feet from an entryway and all of that sort of thing. 
I think we may be too lenient on those. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with 7,000 different concoctions that nobody's ever tested and we superheat and vaporize and then put in our lungs? What could go wrong? Those aren't tested. The EPA doesn't test any of that. You know, nobody does. So I'm thinking, those can be really dangerous. Someday we may find out they're 10 times more dangerous than anything we've done in the past. So um, I guess in answer to your question, pay attention, ask questions, uh, talk to, uh, I have town hall meetings. I ask people when, when I'm asked something there about e-cigarettes, I bring it up at a town hall meeting. I ask the public what they think. Of course, I get beat up a little bit on those that like e-cigarettes, but I, I try to explain to them what could go wrong. Plenty. You don't want to superheat some kind of concoction. Nobody knows what's in it. You know. So anyway, did that does that kind of answer? It, it? I don't sit on that policy board, right? And I don't uh, recall our mayor ever sharing anything that was happening at that policy board, which I would strive to do uh, as the mayor to to share that information, share those decisions uh, with our city council. Uh, I think it's one of the paramount responsibilities our city is health and, and public safety. Uh, we need to provide those services to our citizens. Uh, my wife uh, is a practitioner in, in the mental health field. I applaud the county for what they did uh, with the, uh, the mental health uh, sales tax that they did here in the last year or so. I think that's a big step in the right direction. Those resources are going to the county, but I believe, hopefully in that policy board, I'm not sure if, if you're involved in those decisions, so I'm not knowledgeable of, of that mm -hmm. policy board, but I uh, would be very much so uh, as mayor of Fort Orchard. Um, I just wanted to ask, so Robert, you were on the city council. Mm -hmm. If you don't get elected, are you still on the city council? Yes, okay. so I'm not up for election this term. Uh, or this you'll, you're, you'll keep that position. Yes. And I have a job right now, and uh, if things don't work out the way I want them to, I, st I still have a job in, in my banking career. You're, you're banking, right? Yeah. So and uh, yes, I. But yes, I'm uh, two years into my four year term. Okay. And the, and the council is nonpartisan, right? Correct. Okay. Tell us. <laughs> talk about the relationship. And I was going to ask Tim. You, you talk about your relationship with the existing council, how you try to work together, what you what your kind of take is from it, and then you, Rob, if you were elected, how does it, how do you feel you'll handle the going from being one of the group to being over here, and then how you would do that? Or, you know, personally, how you approach that question. Go ahead. You, go okay. Good. <laughs> um, mayor Mathis is my third mayor, and, um, the other two mayors have done a better job of working collaboratively with the council. As the mayor, I think you need to, to have the vision. You need to have the skills to work collaboratively, collaboratively with the council, the other policy boards, bring that information back, and work to towards your, you, you're not a policy maker, but you need to convince, work collaboratively with the council, get their vision, hopefully it's similar to your vision, if it's not, uh, you need to carry out the directive of the policy board. Uh, it's many times that's where we're butting head with the current mayor is that um, the, pa the pathway, and he didn't want the pathway, and at least the segment where the houses were, and the policy board said, yes we do, and this, and this, this is what we want to get done. And uh, so it's not a good working relationship right now, and that's part of why I'm running, is I believe I have the skills uh, to provide leadership and, and, and bring folks together to, to move us forward. Um, been about that, been about my community from, from my Rotary Club to the Chamber of Commerce. I'm co-founder of uh, the Kurt Wagner Education Fund, um, and we, you know, I know how to get things done and bring people together, and that's what I want to bring to the mayor's office. Tim? Well, um, I think that if the council's sick, I think they have a disease called ism, uh, and that's cronyism, negativism, and favoritism. And if you look back, luckily, I've been 
always a staunch supporter of always having videos of all our council meetings, you'll see that from day one, uh, my opponent and a lot of others there have never tried to work with me. Um, but luckily I realize I don't work for them, I work for the citizens. And we're just a microcosm of the federal government. Uh, I'm the administrative official, and I work for the citizens. And I will step down from that podium, and I will take a, a public position, like on those houses, and I'll do it again. And uh, that's what this council doesn't like about me. I'm not afraid to take a position that I believe is fair and right for the citizens. So um, guess what? If I win again, I'm not changing. I'm going to continue to work for the citizens, not for the council. That's my position. Give me an example of where you think that's been beneficial for the city. Because sometimes um, people from the outside, they see conflict and they don't like it. What do you, well, do you, you know, it, do you we, we cannot have seven people sitting around a bonfire singing Kumbaya. I mean, it's, that's scary to me if everybody agrees. But this council seems to think that they need to be always in agreement or in lockstep with each other. Well, I don't think that even makes for a good decision. I think I like to see some people disagree. And uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, to a large degree, you know, a debate is good. I really think it is. I, mean, I, I think this is wonderful. This is the first time my opponent's ever had anybody run against him. He's been two and a half, he's had two and a half terms and he's never ran an election. So wake up, we're going to have fun with this. We are, we're going to bring out a lot of things. And the other thing I want to say about my opponent, he's been an admitted, or he's been a, a, a legislator for almost eight years. Why hasn't he done any of this? I mean, he, he's constantly going to the mayor, who's the administrative officer, and blaming me, but yet take some leadership. You, you've been there nine years or eight and a half years. What have you done? That's my Where do you feel the council has fallen short during your term? Oh, I think they're, the cronyism is the worst part. I've heard a hundred times from not just this gentleman, but other ones, and they go, well, Mayor, that's not the way we've always done it. But are there things that you would have liked to see done in the city that the council, you feel, has blocked from happening? Oh, yeah, future? well, just, just for an example, non-money things. Uh, I've had three, Paul Powers Park. I had some money in the budget, and I wanted to do some, some minor uh, repairs that would increase the usability of the park. They said, no, no, we don't want to do that. Um, well, actually, three different parks. And then I said, well, look, we have a park we haven't even used. Nobody pays any attention to. And I got over 100 people to clean it up, at least a couple acres. And I said, how about letting us use it for a dog park? No, 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 we can't use it for a dog park. So now it's grown back up into blackberries. When I had people ready to put the fences up, wouldn't it cost the city anything, and we'd have a usable park. So. There's just many examples of trumping me because um, I guess I'm not one of the, the boys. Rob, you, you know? can't speak for the whole council, of course, because there's a number of people, but... And, and that's where you think the completely, different, you completely different role. I'm one of seven of the policy board, and we don't, we aren't in lockstep. We have many split decisions in, in the things that uh, we've accomplished, uh, or, or policies that we've passed. and. and uh, it's just a completely different job, and that's I feel I can do the executive job and do a better job, or I wouldn't be doing this. You know, I've, I've uh, had a very successful career. I'm going to walk away from that because I think I can make a difference in my community. It's the right thing to do. So you think it's not that the council intentionally does not want to work with the executive branch. We're a policy board. We vote policy you know four council members say this is what we want to accomplish you know this is where we're putting our resources it's the executive branch's role to carry that out and why do you think that disagreement has developed based on what an effort stubbornness i think i don't know i can't answer for my opponent so it sounds like you think that the council sets the policy and the mayor implements it and the mayor seems to think that he has a role in to establish policy also. Is that, do I um, it, understand it's, that? Well, it, yes, it, to a degree. And, and on the same side, the council wants to be the administrative officer. Oh, okay. They want to get in, in, you know, involved with the employees. Yeah, with and the that's not their job either. Okay. So, yes, I think we, we have some claim jumping on both sides there that, that doesn't seem to work very well. Okay. 
I, compl I completely disagree. Our role is policy. Executive branch manages staff and carries out the day-to-day -day operation. Your policy board is no different than a board of a directors of a corporation. They tell the CEO, this is how we're going to spend the money, and this is, you know, you, you bring a budget forward, and it's, a, adopt, and it's blessed by the policy board. Have you ever given an order to a city employee? Never. It's, it's not my role. Um, we're, we're kind of wrapping up now. We're getting to the end of our hour that we had promised you guys. Um, and we'll give you a lot, kind of a closing statement. Tell us, um, anyway, if we didn't get to something that you want to bring up, here's your chance to do it. And also maybe just a last, you know, give us a sense of what you think it is personally that kind of separates you. Give us something that, here's why I'm um, the person that should, should be voted for in this city. Here's what makes me different. Um, we'll let, let's see, we start with Tim, so we'll go Rob, then we'll let Tim have the last word. I want to do this because I want to make a difference in my community. I, I believe as the mayor, you need to be able to work collaboratively with others. I've spoke to this already. Provide leadership, provide vision, and, and that's what the job takes. Uh, and I have those skills. Um, I will be able to work with the city council and willing to sit down with property owners, with business community and the citizens and figure out what the direction of our city, you know, what they want the direction of our city to be. And I want our city to be much more than it is. I don't think that's too much to ask. I think we all want to have, you know, healthy and vibrant communities, we want jobs for, you know, the next generation and uh, just want to make our community a better place. That's what it's about for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk about parks. I'm really a, a big parks person. I believe that, that we have a wonderful park system. Uh, when I first took office, there was two, one or two council people making apologies about our parks and saying we had terrible parks and we don't take care of them, and I disagree vehemently with that. So I went out and started looking around, and I discovered, like I say, two parks that we haven't used at all. That are, we're all overgrown. I mean, there was eight foot of blackberries and scotch broom on them. So um, I, I took it upon myself to, to start coming up with plans and programs so we get some usability in, back into those parts. Um, there's no sense in even talking about buying any more land for use for a park until you use all the park property you have. So um, I've uh, improved Clayton Park, Gibbons Park, Vansy Park, Gibbons Field, Paul Powers Park in the four years that I've been mayor. A lot of that's been with volunteer labor, and a lot of it has been because of the community. Uh, LDS Church, uh, Christ the Rock Church, uh, have donated many, many hours. The uh, junior, uh, South Kitsap Junior ROTC has worked in three of the parks for us. So um, I know how to get things done and not spend a lot of money. Um, I, my wife and I have raised four children. Uh, we have a shipyard worker's salary. I was able to retire at 47 and not have to work for anybody since then. So I do know how to work on a budget. And, uh, and matter of fact, our budget this year, last year, the last budget I can quote, was uh, 230 some thousand dollars less than we had budgeted for. And we were able to take that money and put it in our, our rainy day fund, which we want to build up. So uh, I guess parks are near and dear to my heart. I know how to get this stuff done. I just like a little more cooperation from the council. Um, if they won't cooperate, I still know how to get these things done. It just takes me a little longer. Um, I will always manage the budget as if it was my own. And like I said in my beginning statement, uh, I ask the staff every week, what can we do better? What can we get the most money for, or I mean the most use out of? And if they say, I've got an idea, I listen to them. We try to do that. So I love this community. I love Port Orchard. I'll be proud if I'm elected again for mayor. If I'm not, I thank the community. I thank all the nonprofits for working with me this last four years. And I'll go away happy whichever way it goes. Thank you. Guys, thanks for coming in.